1964 film directed by George Pollock and was the fourth and sadly last film in which Margaret Rutherford starred as Miss Marple. This time around, Miss Marple has joined the Board of Trustees of a home slash rehabilitation program for delinquent boys, and at the very first meeting she attends, one of her fellow trustees drops dead. Suspecting foul play, Miss Marple boards the ship that is being used to train and house the boys in hopes of sussing out the truth. And then more people start to turn up dead. Murder ahoy, indeed. Well, it's with some reluctance that I begin this review of the final Rutherford Marple film. And that reluctance is only because it means I'm fresh out of new ones to watch. But let's get underway. The first thing that stands out from the rest of the series is this story's origins. The previous three were all, ostensibly, based on Agatha Christie novels. Their approach to the material was pretty fast and loose in each of those, so this time they forgo even crediting a novel and instead had an original screenplay by David Persall and Jack Seddon. Although there is a hint of similarity to the book, they do it with mirrors. I reviewed the Helen Hayes version of that one, Murder with Mirrors, some time back, and the similarity is in the use of a home for young ne'er-do-wells as the center of the story. I'm sure that's been pointed out by others as well, but I thought it was interesting that they borrowed that while crafting their own story around it. Margaret Rutherford is, as always, amazing in her role, and even gets to play some different notes of this character that she hasn't before. The first thing is her emotional moment that she gets while joining the Board of Trustees. I believe the Reverend that is introducing her mentions an ancestor of Miss Marple's having been involved in the past, and she is quite moved at getting to become a part of the legacy of the Trust. We most typically see her Marple as sly, shrewd, maybe a touch on the nervous side when she gets herself in more trouble than she anticipated, but this is the first time we've ever witnessed her nearly brought to tears, and it's a really nice way to show that more emotionally vulnerable side of her. We're also introduced to Miss Marple, the chemist. That first death she witnesses was achieved by way of a laced snuff box, and Miss Marple obtains a sample of the snuff to begin performing experiments on it in her kitchen at home. She apparently has some experience with such things, as she adeptly runs the sample through the gamut of tests to determine the poison which was used. The fact that she is placing her used droppers and funnels in a gravy boat and teacups is a little concerning, but I'm sure she was cautious in her cleanup methods. I loved that whole scene, and it reminded me of Agatha Christie's real-life experience with poisons and various other drugs from her work during World War I. That scene immediately precedes us getting a glimpse of Marple's paperback murder mystery collection. I believe this is the first time we've seen her obsession with literary mystery since Murder, She Said, although in between we got some nice blatant plugs for Agatha Christie's work. But, upon learning which poison was used and how it was administered, she and Mr. Stringer rush into her library. She climbs a library staircase rather than a ladder, and Mr. Stringer pushes her down the tracks. The camera whips by dozens of paperback novels until she settles on the one in question. Showing this encyclopedic knowledge of mysteries she's read, let alone the one she solved, is a lot of fun. I've mentioned in my last couple reviews the pattern that these movies sometimes stick to, and while this one deviates from that a good degree, we do still have maybe the most crucial one that pops up, showing us a special skill that Marple has that comes in very handy. This time it's fencing. I won't get into who she's fencing with or why, but she reveals she was the woman's fencing champion in 1931 and engages in a duel nearly to the death. I believe Margaret Rutherford underwent some fencing practice before filming and performs much of it herself. The fight is really well done, albeit a little slow and stiff, but that makes sense. Margaret Rutherford was in her early 70s at the time, and her opponent is likely not far off, so the fight looks realistic for the characters. Stringer Davis returns as Mr. Stringer, and no matter how many times he appears, I always wish there was more of him. He's a wonderful character in the series, loyal to Miss Marple almost to a fault, constantly out of his element but always willing to tough it out, and such an endearing presence. He gets plenty to do this time, communicating with Miss Marple via Morse code signals from the shore, he steals a boat to row out to the ship where Miss Marple is staying, the HMS Battledore, and even ends up wanted by the police. The one scene where he is supposed to be tailing some people in the seaside village is great. In particular, the shot where he runs up the street after them in the dark. His jogging to prepare for emergencies in the last film definitely seems to have paid off. The street is lit beautifully and almost reminded me of a film noir. It's almost like the streets of Vienna in The Third Man. High praise, I know, but it's pretty striking. And Mr. Stringer gets a heroic moment, coming to the rescue when, for the fourth time in a row, the murderer attempts to kill Miss Marple. Charles Tingwell is back as well as Inspector Craddock, and I think this is maybe the least he's been utilized in the series. 
He spends much of his screen time angry at Marple for inserting herself once again, and does a lot of sitting around the ship, staring at the suspects. He gets a couple of fun moments, such as believing he's hallucinating when he first glimpses Marple aboard the battle door. And there is a brief scene when Craddock and a fellow police officer come clambering through the windows at the stern of the ship to put Miss Marple's final plan into action. They each come through their own window, one on each side of Marple, and it's nearly in silence, and all the while, Marple sits there, swinging her legs from her seat, knitting. Craddock's brief nod, almost a salute, to Miss Marple ensures that their relationship is still intact, even if it's been strained. That reminds me, though, we get a couple instances where we realize how short Miss Marple is. She's also seen swinging her legs from her bed in prison after she is arrested when the police can't find the fugitive, Mr. Stringer. Lionel Jeffries plays Captain Sidney de Courcy Rumstone and delivers, frankly, a bewildering performance. He looked to me like a bald, bearded Nicolas Cage, and is just about as wild an actor as Nicolas Cage himself can be. It makes the character almost difficult to decipher, because at one moment he's a stern, by-the-book sea captain, and then he's a temperamental eccentric spending his evening curling his beard, or a hammy actor doing a completely unconvincing job of trying to appease Miss Marple. There were a few times where he goes so far over the top that I really did find him funny, but most of the time his line deliveries and accent that seems to vary by the scene were just so strange. I think in the right movie it could work, but the tone of this series was very well defined at this point. Normally quite lighthearted, but with some suspense worked in, and Lionel Jeffries seems to think he's in a slapstick comedy of some kind. I took a quick glance through his filmography, and I've definitely seen him in other films, but I don't remember his performances in them. So I'm curious to compare his demeanor, even in other comedies, to this one, because he really threw me here. The rest of the cast I won't go through individually, they're all uniformly pretty good, but I have to mention the Doctor, played by Nicholas Parsons. He appears every time a new body drops, and he's constantly in a rush. He delivers his dialogue with machine gun speed, and hurries out of the room with claims of a baby being due any moment. I thought he was a great character, and I think if this series had continued, he would have made an excellent running joke. The punchline, he was rather brisk, would also have been a fun gag to work in going forward. You all might be getting tired of me extolling the virtues of Ron Goodwin's scores, but I've got to do it. I can't help it. His Miss Marple theme is a work of genius. There, I think I've used as much hyperbole as I can about that song, but we get it one last time in full during the opening credits. I thought that credit sequence was perfect, by the way, with a dress shop worker bringing Miss Marple her new outfit in the least efficient way possible, one piece at a time. But I didn't care how long it was taking, because each time those curtains shut, it meant more credits and more of that song. I did enjoy Miss Marple wearing this naval officer-inspired costume throughout the movie. She takes her new job very seriously. The rest of the score is quite good, too, with many uses of yo-ho, blow the man down, and that sort of sea shanty style songs worked in. The movie's location shooting was largely done around St. Ma's Cornwall and Denham Village. The film overall looks really good. The seaside town setting is unique for the series. The shots of cars driving along the road that borders the shoreline are quite beautiful as well. Most of the movie, though, is set on the battle door, and we get the usual scenes of Miss Marple creeping around an unfamiliar location at night, armed only with a flashlight. I'm pretty sure that has happened in all of the past three movies, the first being around the grounds of Ackenthorpe Hall, the second, the Gallup Hotel, and the last time, the boarding house where she and her fellow actors are staying. George Pollock gives us some standout thriller-style sequences again, the standout being the murder on the deck of the battle door, complete with a POV shot as the killer charges his victim before running him through with a sword. That also bears mentioning. The murder weapons selected are all unusual. The snuff box, a naval saber, and eventually a poisoned mousetrap. That one also leads to a somewhat unsettling scene when Marple stumbles across another victim, staggering out of hiding before collapsing. It's shot from up above, and both we and Miss Marple don't know what's going on or what has effectively killed this person. And finally, there is a brief shot where we see a dead body hanging from the yardarm. I would say that's probably the most gruesome visual in this entire series, in part because it comes out of nowhere and is so brief, but that image sticks in your mind. We have seen a hanging before in Murder Most Foul, but that time we had the benefit of being kept at a distance, seeing it in shadow through a window blind. I have to say, for the last scene of the final movie in this series, we don't get a great ending. The final dialogue is actually delivered by Lionel Jeffries, and then we cut to a rowboat being paddled away with Miss Marple and Mr. Stringer sitting in the rear, as that theme song kicks in for the end credits. 
I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. Probably no one involved knew that this was going to be the last one. I would have loved to see a final exchange between Marple and Mr. Stringer, or better yet, the two of them with Inspector Craddock, but it wasn't to be. Technically, Margaret Rutherford and Stringer Davis appeared as their characters once more in a cameo in the 1965 film The Alphabet Murders. I've seen just that brief scene on YouTube, and it's pretty good. The two of them walk into frame accompanied with the theme song. They get a couple of lines followed by Miss Marple and Hercule Poirot, as played by Tony Randall of all people, exchanging a confused glance and then parting ways. I'll take that as the ending I was hoping for. Murder Ahoy is, not surprisingly, another excellent entry in the Miss Marple series. Would it have been nice if they'd done a few more? Absolutely. But at least this way, there was never a real dip in quality, the cast stayed consistent, the same director stayed at the helm all the way through, and it resulted in a beloved series that can continue to be enjoyed to this day. Highly recommended. Thanks very much for watching my review. If you've enjoyed these, I hope you'll keep watching as I continue to discover and rediscover the adaptations of Agatha Christie. Thanks again, and adios for now.